Hello, this is Laura Avery, and I'll be talking to you today about ovarian torsion. Let's start with ovarian anatomy. Here we have the midline uterus and vaginal vault with the laterally positioned fallopian tube. The ovary is suspended laterally by the suspensatory ligament and medially by the uterine ovarian ligament. The soft tissues of the meso-ovarium connect the ovary to the fallopian tube. The ovary is unique in that it derives a dual blood supply. Laterally, the gonadal arteries feed the ovary, and branches of the uterine artery come from medial. Ovarian torsion is oftentimes fairly complex. There is rotation on the vascular pedicle, resulting in both venous and lymphatic outflow obstruction. This results in enlargement of the ovary um, and ovarian edema, which over time can overcome the higher pressure arterial system and result in arterial inflow issues with necrosis. Ovarian torsion is difficult to diagnose clinically. It's often nonspecific with nonspecific physical exam findings, so a high index of suspicion is necessary when considering ovarian torsion. Let's discuss the ultrasound findings of ovarian torsion. Size, size, size. Ovarian size is very important in evaluating for ovarian torsion. Here we see an extremely enlarged edematous ovary measuring 11 by 7 by 13 centimeters. Volumetrically, that is enormous. Any ovary over 4 centimeters should be considered as possibly torus, especially if asymmetric from the contralateral side. Torus ovaries are oftentimes enlarged and heterogeneous in echo texture. They may be hyperechoic, hypoechoic, or some combination of very heterogeneous central stroma. Oftentimes, there will be multiple tiny peripheral cysts within the ovaries. Frequently, these cysts are homogeneous in size and considered immature in appearance. Here you can see on this sweep image of the uterus, uh, pardon me, of the ovary, multiple small cysts within this ovary. This is oftentimes referred to as the string of pearl sign of the ovary. Again, the complex blood flow of the ovary makes evaluation of the blood flow difficult in ovarian torsion. Both the laterally oriented ovarian gonadal veins or arteries, pardon me, and the medially oriented uterine arteries. Here we have an enlarged ovary, heterogeneous in echo texture with multiple small peripheral follicles. And on this very um, sensitive power Doppler image, we see no blood flow within the ovary. That is an ovarian torsion. Although frequently there may be absent flow, as in this case. This is a no blood flow compared to the contralateral normal side with its normal low resistant waveform. There are also incidents where there just may be less blood flow. In this ovary, we see decreased blood flow with those peripheral follicles, heterogeneous central stroma, compared to the normal side where there's avid blood flow multidirectional. Here we have absent diastolic flow. That's another possible finding with ovarian torsion. As the pressure increases, you may lose that low um, portion of the cardiac cycle. This is a high resistant waveform. Now, at times there can be actually normal flow on a torsed ovary because of that dual blood supply. Here's an enlarged ovary measuring 5.6 centimeters, multiple tiny peripheral follicles and heterogeneous central stroma. Normal low resistant waveform was seen on the ovary but at laparoscopic evaluation, you can see this um, ischemic ovary was visualized. So the findings on grayscale helped us to determine that this was indeed a torsed ovary. Here's an enlarged ovary measuring five centimeters. There's a bit of free fluid in the cul-de-sac. There was normal Doppler flow on the ovaries with a low resistant waveform. But when we looked at the vascular pedicle, we saw the swirling appearance of the vascular pedicle or the whirlpool sign. This patient went on to laparoscopic evaluation and indeed a torsed ovary was discovered. Location, 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 location. So the location of the ovary can also be a telling feature of ovarian torsion. Here we have a transabdominal view where we can see the fundus of the uterus down into the lower uterine segment. Posterior to the lower uterine segment, we see the enlarged ovary. Here on the sweep images, as we come down to the transverse uterus, we're going to see that ovary tucked in deep into that cul-de-sac in the midline. 
Frequently torsed ovaries will either be deep and low into the cul-de-sac or up high and over the fundus. Either way, frequently they will be in the midline of the pelvis. Here, the, the power Doppler image substantiates that no blood flow is seen within this torsed ovary. Free fluid can often be found in the setting of, of torsed ovaries. This should be simple serous fluid. This ovary is enlarged up to five centimeters in diameter in all planes without any Doppler flow. And this was a torsed ovary with a significant amount of free serous fluid into the cul-de-sac. Let's look at CT evaluation of torsed ovaries. Because of its nonspecific clinical symptoms, frequently we will actually see um, patients present with CT scans rather than pelvic ultrasounds. Coming from posteriorly, you can see this ovary here with multiple little peripheral follicles and one dominant follicle. The ovary is up and over the fundus of the uterus. And then when we come forward, we're actually going to see the adnexal pedicle, vascular pedicle, coming in in a swirling configuration here. Let's go backwards. Swirling and enlarged peripheral follicles up and over the uterus. Frequently, there'll be some degree of free fluid as well. Ovarian torsion often happens in the cases of um, an underlying lesion within the ovary that will increase its chance of torsing some kind of lead point. So here we have an ovary, enlarged follicles, heterogeneous echo texture, no color flow on, no flow on power Doppler. And more laterally within the adnexa, so within that lesion, we see this heterogeneous tip of the iceberg appearance of a dermoid cyst. Underlying lesions such as a dermoid are frequent in ovarian torsion. You can see this is a very large dermoid with the heterogeneous fat, calcifications, soft tissue elements up and over the the uterine fundus in a torse configuration. Ovarian dermoids are the most common tumor that predisposes to ovarian torsion. Here we have a case of um, a, a very hard to, di hard to visualize ovary here without any blood flow, but a very, very large cystic lesion. This patient went on to a CT scan and on these coronal images, you can see this huge cyst. That's the bladder down here and a large torsed ovary in the midline. This was a torsion from a large um, cystic lesion as the lead point. Here we have a patient who had recently undergone ovarian stimulation for infertility and had undergone egg harvest. Um, and here you see multiple follicles that you'd expect in a patient who had undergone um, egg retrieval with the hemorrhage within them. And this is a very enlarged ovary, as you would expect in a patient with uh, recent stimulation. However, in this case, there was no blood flow. We were concerned of ovarian torsion. And unfortunately, um, this was a necrotic ovary uh, at surgery. And this is a pathologic image of this. So ovarian stimulation is also a um, possible precursor for ovarian torsion. Pregnancy increases the risk of ovarian torsion. Sometimes we see these cases on MRI as we are evaluating for appendicitis or something. Um, but here's a case on ultrasound. We see a small, tiny gestational sac, a large volume of simple ser serous fluid within the cul-de-sac posteriorly, and the ovary enlarged, multiple peripheral follicles, a dominant follicle there, and no blood, blood flow. Again, another view of that enlarged ovary, heterogeneous central stroma, multiple small follicles. This is ovarian torsion in the setting of pregnancy. Here's the normal contralateral ovary with uh, smaller in size, homogeneous central stroma, and small little follicles. Beware of pediatrics. Um, this is a difficult diagnosis frequently because of the um, inability to perform transvaginal imaging. Here we have the transabdominal imaging with um, the right ovary marked here and the left ovary marked here. However, in the midline, we can see this large kind of heterogeneous echo, um, echogenic structure with uh, mixed echogenicity. Here's the fundus of the uterus. Here's the lower uterine segment. Very difficult to figure out what this was, given that we've been shown images of each ovary. But at CT, it's easy to identify the fact that this is a large um, torsed ovary down posterior into the cul-de-sac. I believe the right ovary that was measured by transabdominal view is probably the twisted vascular pedicle. Here's a mimic of ovarian torsion that I've seen a number of times. Here we have a large right adnexal lesion, some follicles, correct? But when we extend into the pelvis, we're going to see 
um, some very complex fluid down into the cul-de-sac, demonstrating internal echoes consistent with hemoperitoneum. And then if we look closer at this large adnexal region, we realize that there aren't any follicles in this portion of the ovary. And on color blood flow, you notice that just this portion of the ovary demonstrates color blood flow. This is not a torsed ovary. This is actually a normal-sized ovary with a bleeding hemorrhagic cyst, large volume of hemoperitoneum, and a very dense heterogeneous blood clot adjacent to the ovary. Here is another patient demonstrating how extensive bleeding can be in an ovarian cyst. Here we have a large volume of hemoperitoneum, a large um, cyst down in the pelvis with, those very, with that very densely clotted blood adjacent to the bleeding site, whereas the more serous portions of blood are extending into the upper abdomen and around the liver. Here is another case of a very enlarged ovary. It's over four centimeters in size, and I guess not very enlarged, but over four centimeters in size, and we demonstrate multiple small follicles. Notice that the seroma is fairly homogeneous in echo texture. And when we looked at the contralateral side, it was a similar appearance. On MRI, you notice that both ovaries are in normal position and demonstrate multiple tiny follicles. This is polycystic ovarian disease and not ovarian torsion. So this is a symmetric finding um, and there was no free fluid or compromise of vasculature. So in conclusion, don't be dissuaded by history. The history can be extremely variable. Um, all you have to have is ovaries to consider ovarian torsion. Uh, don't forget that this can occur in definitely the, the pediatric population, pregnant population, and the perimenopausal population. Um, focus on the grayscale imaging, including the enlargement of an ovary, the heterogeneous central stroma, peripheralized fol follicles, such as that um, string of pearl sign, abnormal midline location, either down deep into the cul-de-sac or up over the fundus of the uterus. And don't be dissuaded by um, the presence of Doppler flow, but do look for abnormal waveforms, such as loss of that diastolic portions with increased high-resistant waveform and or the whirlpool sign. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your attention.